I'm a pastor, so this may sound strange coming from my mouth. Be wary of people like me. You should see me on Sunday mornings. I wear a white robe and a cross necklace. I tell people, this is what God says. I teach about Jesus, faith, morality, sin, forgiveness, heaven, and hell. I say it with conviction. I want people to believe what I say because it's the truth and lives hang in the balance. But still, I got to warn you, be wary of people like me. The white robe, the cross necklace, Bible words wrapped up in polished rhetoric. How do you know that it's not all a disguise? Isn't there a saying about, about wolves that dress up like sheep? In late medieval Europe, there, there was not a whole lot of wariness toward people with church titles and fancy outfits. They were on a whole different level. They were right up there with the Almighty. You didn't need to read your Bible. Not that you had one anyway. That's what popes and priests were for. They passed down the messages from God. That was your job. That was their job. Your job was to obey, not challenge. And things did not tend to turn out well for people who forgot that arrangement. So you'd think that it must have crossed the mind of a, of a young theology professor from a backwoods university in Germany when he found himself standing in front of, well, the most powerful people in the world. This is not what Martin Luther was expecting when he first published his 95 theses. He was hoping to spark an academic debate about the source of the church's authority and the church practice of selling indulgences. To his surprise, that, that little spark that he was hoping would, would start a debate, that spark started the world on fire. And now it was beginning to look like he was going to get consumed in the flames. This is a 19th century artist rendering of the Diet of Worms. If you've never heard of it before, it's not what you think. Nothing to do with little, eating little crawly things that go through the dirt. A diet was, a, was an official meeting of the leaders of the Holy Roman Empire, sort of like a G8 summit of the 16th century. It was presided over by the recently elected Holy Roman Emperor Charles V of Spain. And it was held in the German city of Worms, or as they said, Worms, about 40 miles southwest of Frankfurt. So Charles the most powerful man in the world, on paper at least. If we look at a map of Europe, all these areas here, together with territories in Asia and the Americas, were under his control, on paper at least. In reality, trying to hold all that together was like trying to wrestle with a house of cards. Charles' biggest headache at the moment was over here. Not the usual intra-European power struggles. They, those weren't the biggest thing right now. The biggest thing was the army of the Ottoman Empire in the east, which was starting to push to the west in a bid to ex enlarge its territory, headed straight towards Central Europe and the Holy Roman Empire. So Charles, he's in the position that he needs to get the German princes on board, and their soldiers, of course, in order to push the enemy back. That was the occasion for this four-month summit in early 1521. The theme of the summit was, uh, we, we need to set aside our differences and unite our forces. One of, the, one of the biggest obstacles to that coalition building, though, was this theology professor from backwoods Germany who was questioning the authority of the pope. By doing that, he was tearing apart at the fabric of society. Not good for Charles. To, to boil it all down, what you have at the Diet of Worms is the King of Europe, backed by more than a few German princes and all the muscle of the Roman Catholic Church and its Pope, versus a monk. This, is never, this had never happened before. Not, not to this extent. A man with no title, virtually no power to speak of, standing in the way of the world's most powerful church-state machine. They need to deal with him. You'd think they could have just rolled right over him, right? They'd done that before, and they seriously considered doing it again with Martin Luther. But the problem this time was 
they had the people to contend with. All those, those dirty masses on the lower level who were supposed to obey, not challenge. Martin Luther's pen had gotten to them. It started with his 95 Theses, in which he more or less politely questioned the church's practice of selling forgiveness for money, questioning the pope's authority to, to authorize such a, such a practice. He didn't think it would be that big of a deal, but then much to his astonishment, this newfangled technology called the internet, the internet just saturated Europe with copies of this. Did I say the internet? Printing press, I get those two mixed up, but they have a lot in common with each other. The printing press just saturated Europe with copies. Martin Luther, he, he dared to, to stand up against the people who, who spoke for God, and the world took notice. And then over the next three and a half years, when he wasn't, when he wasn't reading or, or lecturing on the Bible, he was writing. And, and writing, and writing some more. And the printing presses just kept churning this out like thousands of tweets. People were listening. If you could read, you were reading Luther, challenging the church teaching that had no basis in the Bible, challenging ever more vociferously the authority of the church to establish teaching that had no basis in the Bible. Luther's pen was proving to be more powerful than the emperor's sword. They got to deal with him. But if, if Charles were to simply command off with his head like the Pope wanted him to, he'd face at the very least a popular revolt, maybe even worse, a popular whole revolution. So to produ so produce at least the, the pretense of due process at the Diet of Worms, Martin Luther would have the opportunity to take back what he had written before they condemned him. Late afternoon, April 17th, 1521. The mouse is led into a room of snarling cats. He's face to face with the Holy Roman Emperor, his electors, their attendants, high-ranking representatives of Pope Leo X. They haven't given him an agenda or prepped him. He, he does not know what to expect when he walks into this room. Their strategy is intimidation. Keep him on his heels. There's a table in the room with books on it. The spokesman for the emperor directs Luther to the table with two questions. Are these yours? And is there anything in here you want to take back? Answer now. He looks at the table pours over the books. These are mine. I've written more. As to whether I will retract anything that I've written here, this, this touches God and his word. This affects the salvation of souls. Please give me time. They give him a day. The sun has set by the time they bring him in the following day, so the room is, is lit by candles. He's had his time to think. So, will you recant? He speaks for several minutes, mostly distinguishing between the tone of his writings and their substance. Agreed, at times, maybe a lot of the time, his, his tone was rather harsh, unbefitting his church office. But then again, he was addressing serious crimes committed by the church. To simply retract those wholesale would, would make him a party to the church's tyranny. But of course his audience wasn't interested in distinctions between tone and substance. They wanted him to fall in line. Obey, not challenge. So for the last time, will you recant? We'll go to his own words here. Since then, your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer without horns or teeth. I do not believe in the authority of either popes or church councils by themselves, for it is plain that they have often erred and contradicted each other. Unless I am convinced by scripture and by plain reason in those scriptures which I have presented, for my conscience is held captive to the word of God, I cannot and will not recant anything. 
It's neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. This wasn't an attention monger picking a fight or looking to go viral on Facebook. His personal writings from that week reveal that he was, he was pretty sure this was going to end badly for him. That fear was confirmed several weeks later when Emperor Charles V made an official declaration that turned Luther into an outlaw and put a bounty on his head. For the rest of his life, he was a wanted man, kept alive only by the beneficence of his territorial prince. So why would he do this to himself? Why not just swallow hard, fall in line, live free, live, live in peace? Well, for one thing, he had done something virtually unheard of in his day. He'd read the Bible. He'd read the Bible. Not just, not just attending church and going through the motions and carrying out whatever instructions his priest had given him for earning his ticket into, into heaven. That's, that was his life before he became a professor of theology. He had swallowed whole everything that the guys with church titles and fancy outfits had fed him. And that drove him to hate the God that he knew he was supposed to love. And that just turned into this vicious cycle of trying harder and harder to love and falling only further and further into hate. Because how could he love a God who only condemned him every day? But then he started lecturing on the Bible, which required, of course, that he, that he actually study the Bible. Not just individual verses cop copied and pasted to make him say whatever you want them to. Um, entire books, the Psalms, Galatians, Romans, and as he studied, the scales fell from his eyes. He studied, and he discovered that the Bible at its heart isn't an instruction manual on, on how to get into heaven, do this and that and the other thing for God to accept you. It's a love story. God's love for people who didn't love him. It's not about people climbing their way up to God. No, we can't. So God does it the other way around. He stoops down to us. Like Jesus said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Martin Luther read the Bible, and he saw God punish his son Jesus on the cross instead of condemning Martin Luther. Martin Luther walks free. He read the Bible, and he, and he heard Jesus cry from the cross, it is finished. He read the Bible. He heard the Apostle Paul write in Romans, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He read the Bible, and he discovered something he had never known before. Peace. The Christian life is not like American Idol, where, where you do your best for the judges and cross your fingers and hope they're in a good mood. That's what the popes and the priests and the councils were preaching. And through the fear that system produced, the church had become as powerful as any nation. But then this no-name theology professor from backwoods Germany actually studies the actual Bible, and he finds something more powerful than their fear. Peace. Peace from a God who gave his son for sinners to make them his children. Not on account of what they've done for him. Other way around. It's what he's done for them. He wasn't expecting to land himself in front of the most powerful people in the world when he started writing about this. But once he found himself there, how could he possibly keep quiet? God's peace was more powerful than their intimidation. So back to where we started. Be wary of people like me. It's not that I don't want you to trust me. It's that white robes and cross necklaces and polished rhetoric and church titles aren't the Bible. 
the Bible is the sole source of authority for what God's church believes and teaches. The Bible is the sole source of God's peace for every sinner. That's where God speaks truth to power. That's where God speaks truth to you. And it's not beyond you. If you're reading the Bible already, keep it up. If, if you haven't read it or if you're not reading it right now, dive in and don't be afraid to go deep. Find a, a friend or a pastor like, like me to dig into it with you. Ask them hard questions. Make sure they're getting their answers from the source. Read, study, and love the book where God speaks to you himself. It may not land you in front of the most powerful people in the world, but you'll find peace. Thank you.